ിയുസൂനബി Continuing with the talking about the events leading up to Karbala uh, last week we were talking about the Khalifa of Uthman radiyallahu anhu who is the third khalifa uh, and so before this you know you have attempts from the hip- hypocrites to try to infiltrate the state you know become part of the state and they get knocked down every time um Omar Radio one time he asked Hudayf bin Yaman Hudayf bin Yaman Radio was known as the keeper of the prophet secrets and he also knew Rasulullah so some entrusted him with the names of the hypocrites so Omar Radio one time asked him he said are there any hypocrites within my administration and he said yes so so Omar Radio had a suspicion about somebody and he removed him from that position So during the time of Uthman, Radhi Uthman, Radhi again, you know, he's a person who has a very soft soul, you know, a gentle soul, uh, very soft-hearted, uh, and people tend to take advantage of of this. You know, it's like uh, a certain person used to say that people take kindness for weakness, and so, and as we mentioned last week, you know, you have. most of the companions who were with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi from the beginning by this time have become very old you know Uthman radio when he is martyred will be 84 years old okay. so and when he be accepted Islam he was in his 30s so so again you know and these are you know people who were with rasulullah so some they become old or they become or they were martyred already two names worth mentioning who infiltrated the state one is marwan bin hakam uh, marwan is the first cousin of uthman radiyallahu anhu he is also the son-in-law of uthman radiyallahu anhu he When Islam came his father Hakam is the one who after Uthman Uthman accepted Islam tied him or wrapped him up in a in a rug and lit it up on fire and it was Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu who saw this and came and saved him from the situation after the conquest of Mecca Hakam and Marwan both came and showed that they had accepted Islam Hakam try to manipulate some of the revelation you know whenever a revelation would come rasulullah sallam would go to the scribes and have them write it down and then also recite it back to him they would read it back to him and they would recite it back to him so that there was no discrepancy in what was revealed and what was transmitted on the paper and also what the people transmitted to their memory and he wouldn't simply go to one scribe you know he would go to multiple people at the same time who would be sitting there and doing this as a group hakam knew how to write read and write and so he tried to manipulate or alter some of the revelation which of course is an impossibility when he was called out on it you know he gave his excuses which had no meaning and so rasulullah sallam exiled him he didn't accept it as excuse or anything he exiled him and with him went his son marwan 
during the Khilafah of Uthman how come he had already died? And so now Uthman Aradim, because he is a relative, calls him back in. And then eventually he becomes part of the state. So this is one name to remember. The other name is Abdullah bin Sa'ad bin Abi Sar, who is the nurse brother of Uthman. You know, as you know, in Arabia, you know, the city Arabs would send their children out to be nursed in, in the wilderness to make them strong and also to make sure that their language was. This is what Quraysh would do to make sure that the language was not adulterated by, you know, other people coming in who couldn't speak the language well. And so Uthman Aradiwa and Abdullah bin Abisar, they were nurse brothers. And so Abdullah bin Abisar, he accepted Islam in the beginning. He made Hijra or immigrated from Mecca to Medina with the Rasulullah. He also knew how to read and write. And he also tried the same exact thing. Revelation came. You know, he tried to alter it when he was called out on it. You know, there are people who say, well, you know, he made a mistake and so then, you know, this is how this happened. But when, when Rasulullah Sallallahu called him out on it, instead of asking for forgiveness, you know, he leaves Medina, goes back to Mecca, apostates, officially when he's there. And then he, he buys two slave girls who are very good in poetry. And he has them do poetry in which they are abusing the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When Makkah was conquered, you know, eight years after Rasulullah had immigrated, so Makkah is conquered, and of course, you know, if you read the books, everybody will tell you this was a bloodless uh, surrender of Makkah. However, there were certain names that Rasulullah gave, and he said, you know, when, when he gave the orders, he said that even if you find these people hanging on to the cloth of the Kaaba, they are still to be executed there, even in that condition. The names included these two slave girls, as well as Abdullah bin Abisa. And so, and one of the slave girls was actually executed in this manner. She was holding on to the, to the cloth of uh, the Kiswa, the cloth of the Kaaba, and she was executed in that condition. Abdullah, he sees a way in through Uthman, so he comes to Uthman, you know, in hiding, because he's running, because he knows if anybody else sees him, he'll be executed. So he comes to him and he knows that, you know, uh, the nature of Uthman, uh, his softness, plus their nurse brother. So he comes to him and he says, take, you know, I, I want to ask for forgiveness, so take me to the Messenger of Allah. So, so Uthman uh, takes him, and he arrives at the time when Rasulullah is taking bayah, taking the allegiance from the people of Makkah. So they're all lined up, and he's taking their allegiance. And he gets in line, and when he, his turn comes, he offers his allegiance to Rasulullah Sallallahu and Rasulullah Sallallahu turns his face. And he comes from the other angle, and he offers his allegiance again, and Rasulullah Sallallahu again turns his face. And then the third time he offers it again, and again Rasulullah Sallallahu turns his face, and then finally he, ex he, the fourth time he accepts, he says fine. And then he leaves. He give, gives his allegiance, and Rasulullah Sallallahu sends him on his way. And then, and the narration is in Abu Dawud, Rasulullah Sallallahu turns to the companions that were there. And he says to them, he says, was there no one amongst you who could have executed him for me when they saw that I rejected his, ex his allegiance? The companions, they said, Ya Rasulullah so we were waiting for you to give us a sign. And Rasulullah so says that it is not to the prophets to give such signs. When they saw the rejection of his allegiance, that was sign enough. And in fact, before that, the order to execute him on sight 
was enough. If you read most scholars, they'll tell you that, well, you know, he became a good Muslim afterwards and he died in Islam and all of these things. But my issue is, again, why did Rasulullah neglect or reject him? And if he rejected him, then why afterwards, you know, and then accepted him, why did he ask this question? Was there no one amongst you who could have executed him for me? Because if you look at the attitude of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Wahshi, you know, Wahshi was the one who killed the uncle of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hamza, who was very close to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi In the Battle of Uhud, the Wahshi is the one who came in, killed him, and, you know. And Wahshi also had an order of execution on sight. He was not included in this order of holy in the Kiswa, but he was ordered, the order was to execute on sight. When Wahshi left Taif and came to Medina to accept Islam, he came in disguise because he knew if anybody saw him, he would be dead. When he comes before Rasulullah and takes off his cloak and the companions see who, see who it is, they all pull out their swords and they're about to kill him and it is Rasulullah who stops them and says, no. Leave him. He's come to me. But they say, Ya Rasulullah, this is Wahshi. And Rasulullah says that that is more pleasing to me for, for someone to accept Islam than thousands of, of infidels to be killed. Very different attitudes here. During the Khilafah of Uthman, eventually Abdullah bin Abi Sar became the governor of Egypt. Marwan became chief counsel. If you look at the rebellion and the turmoil during the Khilafah of Uthman, the main rebellion came from Egypt. And when we look at the issues that became part of the state, they came from Marwan. You know, last week we were talking about the groups, you know, one group from Egypt, even though all of the turmoil really started in Egypt, and then it spread to the rest of the Muslim Empire. So you have this group coming from Egypt, coming from Busra, coming from Kufa. Ali Radun goes and he talks to them. I'm going to go over this quickly because we've talked about this last week. He goes and talks to them. They are satisfied with what Ali Radun says to them. And there's an agreement that the governor of Egypt will be changed and, and Muhammad bin Abu Bakr Radun, who was the son of Abu Bakr Radun, he is also a companion of Rasulullah. So he will be made the governor of Egypt. And Abdullah will be removed. The three groups go back, each one taking a different path. And suddenly, all three groups come back together. Because the group going to Egypt caught somebody. And the person that they caught was, this, was the servant of Uthman, who was carrying a state-sealed letter to the governor of Egypt. Uthman Radio had sent a letter informing Abdullah bin Abi Sar that he was to be removed and that uh, you know, Abu Muhammad bin Abu Bakr would take his position. The letter that was opened was instructing Abdullah bin Abi Sar that he is to kill Abdullah bin Abu Bakr when he comes. And so this group, they come back, oh, see, you know, this is treachery. So they show the letter and then again Ali Radun steps in and he asks Uthman, what is this? You know, where is this letter from? And Uthman he says, he says, I agree that you know the servant is mine, the camel is mine that he's traveling on, the seal on the letter is mine, but the letter is not mine. And if you actually look at the letter, it's simply changing three dots. They changed three dots to change the whole word, from from removal, you know, from you handing over the rule to you killing the person. That's all they did. 
But the other interesting aspect of this is all three groups came back together. How did they know? They're traveling on different paths. How did they know? How did the other two groups know? Other than this was a plan from the beginning. Of course, when they come back and they say, oh, you know, see what this, and when Uthman says, look, I didn't write this letter. This is not the letter I wrote. The people say, oh, it must be Marwan. This is where, you know, you get into such confusion and intrigue. You know, where you have these groups or you have these people on the inside who are able to manipulate the situation to such an extent that everybody, everyone becomes confused. You know, they do things even against themselves simply to make it seem like they're innocent. So the people, when they... Marwan knows that these people are going to demand him. But he also knows that Uthman will not hand him over because there is no official proof to what he's done. You know, this is pretty much, yeah, everybody knows it was him, but no one can, there's no, there's no physical proof that it was him. Sharia is based on what is apparent and what you can prove. You know, if you look at the difference between Musa al-Islam and Khizr al-Islam in Surah Kahf, you know, one is, is in complete authority of the Sharia, Musa al-Islam, and the other is an authority on Hakikat, the reality of things. The reality may not be what you can prove and what is apparent. However, you cannot instill Sharia punishments unless you can prove it. And again, against Marwan, there is no proof. And Uthman knows that if he hands him over, they will kill him. But based on what proof? Nothing. And we will come back to this. This point is an important point also during the Khilafah of Ali. Because when they, when they murder Uthman, then what you have are you have thousands of people saying that I am the murderer of Uthman. I am the murderer of Uthman. Well, when you have that happening, now you can't punish anybody. Because you know that there were only a handful of people that went to murder Uthman. And now you have thousands of people claiming that they are the murderer. So that creates doubt as to who truly was the murderer. And you, because you know thousands of people didn't do it. And you can't punish thousands of people for what they didn't do. And these are tricks uh, you know, that shaitan teaches these people. You know, this is how they manipulate the situation. So when Uthman Ura refused to hand him over, and again, most of the companions had already left to go and make hajj. You know, when the groups left, they went to go and make hajj. Because they thought everything's, you know, agreed upon and, and it's peace again and everything's good. The situation escalates to such to, to such a point that the same rebel groups now they you know they laid siege to the house of Uthman before now they laid siege to the extent that no food can get in and out, no water can get in and out. You know this is the same person for whom Rasulullah Sallam said that Uthman bought Jannah from me twice, and one of those times was when the Muslims in Medina they didn't have any good water to drink and Uthman bought the well at an exorbitant price in order to allow the Muslims to have good water. And the same person who when the Muslims in Medina had nothing to eat would buy food and give them plenty to eat. And now there is no water for him and there is no food for him. The companions that are there are asking him permission, give us permission that we draw our swords. And he, he says, I will not give you this permission. 
Because again, he knows that there are innocent people who are caught up in the propaganda. And he's not willing to shed their blood. You know, he's willing to give his own life, but he's not willing to shed their blood. So Ali, you know, when he sees he can't draw his sword, you know, he places his two sons, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, as well, at the door of Uthman, that no one is to come, is to be allowed in to harm Uthman. Abdullah ibn Zubair, the son of Zubair bin Awam, he's also placed at the house as a guard. You know, what eventually the rebels do is that they create a commotion, and when these went to go look, they jumped the roof from the other side. The first one to come with the sword drawn against Uthman, and this is how strong this propaganda was. The first one to come with his sword drawn against Uthman uh, was Muhammad bin Abu Bakr. Uthman is reading the Quran. And he simply he looks up at Muhammad bin Abu Bakr and he says to him, he says, Oh, the son of my brother, if your father were to see you now, what would he say? Which is interesting because he doesn't say, he doesn't invoke Islam. That what are you doing this is un-Islamic or anything like that. Because he knows the mindset of, of Muhammad bin Abu Bakr is that he is killing him for Islam. Because of all the propaganda. So he simply says, oh the son of my brother, if your father were to see you now, what would he say? Those words shook him so hard. Mm -hmm that he came to the realization of what was going on. Because, you know, when you're in that state, it's almost like you're in a drunken state. There's all, uh, you know, the only thing that's bouncing around in your head is all the propaganda and you can't think straight. So, when he, when it, when these words shake him, he takes his, the sword that he has and he throws it away and he, he runs away and he says that I am free from the murder of Uthman. I have nothing to do with this. And then others came behind him and they murdered Uthman. And as they were murdering him, his wife tried to stop them and her fingers were cut in the process. These same people who murder Uthman, now they take the shirt of Uthman, which is, you know, red with his blood. They take the fingers of his wife and they go to Sham, to Damascus. And in front of Mabia, Radion, who is the governor of Damascus and he is the cousin of Uthman, Radion, they, they swear on the member. They swear by Allah on the member of Rasulullah so I'm saying that this, you know, that Uthman has been murdered and all of this is the doing of Ali. In the meantime, in Medina Munawwara, you know, the situation is, is such that the people are afraid to come out of their houses. The rebels, after murdering Uthman, now they won't even allow that his body should be taken out and buried until three days later when Ali Radim finally he steps in and he says, you know, allow us to bury him. There were 17 people in the funeral of Uthman. That's it, 17. Because everybody else was afraid to come out of their houses because the situation was such. Some people later they came to Ali Radim and they said, oh, you know, these people, they were remorseful for what they did to Uthman. And Ali Radhiyallahu says that their remorse is like that of Shaitan. Mm -hmm. You know, Shaitan, when he, uh, Allah SWT says that when he deceives somebody, you know, he gives the way, he whispers to them and they follow his whisper. Mm -hmm. And he deceives them, then he runs away and he says, Inni akhafullah rabbul alameen. You know, that I fear Allah, you know, the Lord of the worlds. You know, before he didn't have any fear and now suddenly, oh, I fear Allah, the Lord of the worlds. You know, it's just an excuse. And then he turns around and does the same thing all over again. Mm 
So this is what Ali Rani says that their remorse is like the remorse of shaitan. It has no value. The people come to Ali and they say they, they ask him to become the Khalifa. Ali Radio tells them, he says, look, he says, you choose someone amongst yourself and I will I will support him. So they go back. And then they come back and they say there is no one else who can who can deal with the situation at hand. So he says, fine, I will accept this position under the condition that all of the, of the companions of Badr give me allegiance. If all of them agree and give allegiance to me, then I will accept the position. And so all of them agreed, and in the masjid on the member of Rasulullah they all gave him bayah, they gave him allegiance. And then after them, then their people started coming and giving him allegiance. And then he writes letters to all of the governors uh, of the six states. And all of them agreed with the exception of Mawiyah in Sham. Because, you know, can these same people who murdered Uthman are over there telling them, oh, telling him, oh, see, you know, Ali Radim is the one who had this done. Because among the propaganda was also that only Ali has the right to be Khalifa. No one else has the right to be Khalifa, so Uthman should be removed from his position and Ali should be put in his place. So you create this uh, thought in people's minds that Ali Radim wants this position. So now when you tell Mabiyah Radim, oh see Ali is the one who perpetrated this this act, there's pause, you know, there's, there, there's that possibility now is already ingrained. Mawiyah mm -hmm. writes him back saying that I will not give allegiance to you until you take the revenge for the blood of Uthman. Mm -hmm. The same time that they murder Uthman, now you have rioted, riots coming up everywhere in the empire. Not just in Medina Munawwara, but every place else in Kufa, in Basra, in Yemen, in every place you have the same people creating issues and, and making getting the people out and rioting. Ali Radun says that how can I take revenge for Uthman when there is no peace in the empire? And how can I take revenge for Uthman when there is no witness to the act? I mean, I, we don't even know who, who did this yet. We can't prove. Ali Radun is Ali, so he has the knowledge, he knows. But there's no proof. The wife of Uthman, Radion, she, the only one that she recognized was Muhammad bin Abu Bakr, Radion, but she also knew that he didn't do it. I'll end here today, inshallah, we'll continue from here next week, again going over the issues that eventually led up to such a condition where Karbala could happen. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us understanding uh, and fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family, his companions and all of those whom they love inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah go in.